Hello and welcome to our next lecture of soil mechanics, where we are going to talk about where we are going to continue talking about <coughs> soil permeability. So to give you a quick overview of what we have been studying through the last couple of lectures, <coughs> so we have been talking about the flow of water through the soils. We saw that the main and important thing for us uh, talking about the water flow through the soil is to determine the discharge that is the total quantity of water that is flowing through the soil and this discharge we we have seen in the previous lectures that this discharge can be determined by using the following equations given here the main parameters which are required for the determination of the charge are the hydraulic conductivity k and the hydraulic gradient which is given by i uh, in the previous lecture we talked about the determination of hydraulic conductivity uh, by the laboratory testing and by some empirical methods in today's lecture we are basically going to talk about the determination of option of hydraulic conductivity k by using the different field testing So let's have a look at how the water flows through the soil. Now, first we'll talk about a few basics, how the water flows through the soil and some of the basic terms. And then using those basic terms, we will come to our actual topic, which is the in-situ determination of hydraulic conductivity. Now, this figure shows some uh, a certain hilly area. And in this hilly area, you can see that this is uh, the natural ground surface and at some depth beneath this natural ground surface there is the ground water table you can observe from this figure that the natural ground water table it does not it remains horizontal in almost flat areas like if you consider only this localized area you will see that the ground water table remains almost horizontal but it curves and move downward in it moves downward in the areas uh, in sloping areas so by doing all this the groundwater table follows a certain profile and this profile is somehow dependent upon the profile of the natural ground surface because of this undulation in the profile of the groundwater table there are some areas where we see these sort of streams uh, you might observe that uh, in such sort of streams in many hilly areas and you might be thinking where this water is coming from. So this water generally comes, many times this water comes from the natural water table. And another important thing to observe from this figure is that this natural water table, it does not remain constant. Um, for example, in some, in dry seasons, this water table goes, goes down. And if this water table goes down, so as the water level in the stream, it will also go down. So, uh, and another important thing to note is that you might have observed many times in, in villages where we often use hand pumps or wells, uh, a borehole which, is, which we derive into the ground, that borehole is driven down to a certain depth, which is greater than the ground water table. So unless we have this well installed within the groundwater table, we cannot draw water from it. We'll talk more about it in the coming slides. So the first definition that you need to remember is of an aquifer. So what is an aquifer? Aquifer is known as a stratum or a ground surface, which has sufficient porosity and permeability to store and transmit groundwater. For example, the ground surface here is such that that it can not only store water in it, but it can also trans transmit the water through its surface. So such a ground surface, which can not only store water, but can also transfer water, is known as an aquifer. So for example, if we talk about our city, if we do a borehole, we often find water there. In fact, we always find water there at a certain depth. So it means that there is a water aquifer which is present underground uh, in, in our areas. 
So let's explore this thing a bit further by using this uh, by using the second figure, which we can which shows a sort of a three D model of the sim of the same area. Now in this area, what you can you can again observe a lot of things. For example, uh, this is the natural ground surface. Beneath this natural ground surface, there is an aquifer. There is a there is an aquifer of water. So this water is this is a soil stratum which is containing a lot of water. This water some at some places appears in the form of streams, and from streams, this water can get drained off in far flung areas. What what we uh, but what we do is that if we draw if we draw a well uh, in order to drive water from the aquifer as we have seen in the previous slide we must draw a well which penetrates into this aquifer if this well does not penetrate into the aquifer this well will be unsuccessful and we will not have any water in it. But a very interesting phenomena occurs in some in many hilly areas and even sometimes in plain areas that you draw a well up to a certain depth at a certain point and you do not get water from it and you draw another well which is not too far off from it just a little distance away from the same well location and you see at the same depth you find water now if a simple example of this can be thought of like drawing and in trying to install a well at one corner of a certain ground and maybe drilling a borehole down to 100 feet depth and till 100 feet depth at one corner of the ground you do not get any water and then you move to the other corner of the ground of the same ground which is hardly maybe maybe 30 maybe 100 or 200 feet away from the first point you do the similar depth borehole and you you find water there something which you can see from this figure as well now if you are in that ground drilling boreholes so you will be amazed that at point at the first location you did the same depth of borehole and did not get any water and when at the second location you did the same depth borehole and you found water so you might be surprised that what has changed beneath the ground because of which at the first location you could not find any water and at the second location you could find water so what has changed there is can be explained can be explained from this figure so in some areas what happens is that there is a there is a layer of relatively impervious material which is present beneath the ground surface such a layer which is often called as aquifluid or aquifuge so what this layer does is that this layer actually collects some quantity of water in it this water which is collected above this aquifuge because this aquifuge has low permeability because of very low permeability it does not let the water flow it does not let the water move down and go into this aquifer so the water stays at this step and because this water is known as perched water table now this term of perched water table is very important and you should remember this term because it is very frequently used in geotechnical engineering and even in the in practical civil engineering in this aquifer, it is generally formed by an impervious layer, and this impervious layer can be of the form of clays or rock or any similar material having very low permeability. So now, once you have <laughs> seen what an aquifer is, let's look and let's explore more about. A different the different types of an aquifer so basically there are two different types of an aquifer one is called as a confined aquifer and other is known as an unconfined aquifer so what is a confined aquifer and what is an unconfined aquifer if you will notice closely this unconfined aquifer is something similar to what you have seen previously now this unconfined aquifer is basically bound by the water table so uh, this is the water this is the water surface which has an impervious layer maybe at the bottom but at the top surface of an unconfined aquifer is open to the natural environment so because it is open to the natural environment 
any flow in a confined aquifer is the flow due to gravity. So for example, here is an unconfined aquifer. At the, the top surface of the unconfined aquifer, it is called unconfined because the top surface of the unconfined aquifer is open to the atmosphere. When you compare it with a confined aquifer, you can see the basic difference is that this confined aquifer has a impervious layer at the top, at the top and an impervious layer at the bottom. So you can see because of the presence of this impervious layer at the top and impervious layer at the bottom, the water in this confined aquifer actually flows under pressure instead of, and the flow is somehow similar to the pipe flow compared to the gravity flow in an unconfined aquifer. So you can observe this thing that in an unconfined aquifer, when the water flows, the water, we can have a we can have a well and from this well we can take the water out whereas in case of confined aquifer because the water flows under pressure so if you install a piezometer or a well here so the water level because of the high pressure inside the confined aquifer water level actually rises higher and this water level even sometimes rises so high that it comes out of the ground and starts flowing like an artisan well. We'll talk more about it in the next slide. So let's, let's talk more about the confined aquifer. So in case of a confined aquifer, you can see that we have a, we have a pervious layer and this pervious layer is confined by an impermeable layer at the top and an impermeable layer at the bottom. Now, so a water particle which started from this point is flowing down in this pervious zone and coming downwards moving in this direction. Now, because this water particle started from this point, so this water particle would have some head. Now, this head, while moving from this point to this point, it would have lost some amount of its head. Some amount of the energy would have been lost. But many times it happens is that despite of losing this energy, the energy is so high that if we drill a borehole or if the water finds some way to come out of the ground, the wa water pressure inside this confined aquifer is so high that it starts gushing out. It starts gushing out in the form of an artesian spring. Now imagine that if there was no head loss, when the water moved from this point down here, if there was no head loss, if there was no loss of energy, in, in moving water from the starting point to the bottom point, this water level would have been to the same height. But this water level can never reach the same height because of some head loss that has occurred while the water was flowing from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain. So this is a concept that we have discussed in the previous classes as well. So let's talk about our actual topic for the day, which is how to determine the hydraulic conductivity in the field. So in order to determine the hydraulic conductivity in the field, we basically use three different methods. One is that we sometimes install pumping wells with a observation or observation holes. We often have the borehole test and we often perform the packet test. So these are the three main categories which are used for the determination of hydraulic conductivity in the field. Out of these, the second one, which is the borehole test. So this test is almost similar to the constant head and the falling head permeability test that we've studied in the previous lecture. So the only difference in these tests is that the constant head and the falling head test that we studied were performed in the laboratory. And these tests, similar constant head and the falling head permeability test can be performed in the field as well, where we install a borehole, we drill a borehole, and in that borehole, either we keep the, keep the head of water constant, or we can let the water level fall down and determine the discharge through it. 
So we can determine the permeability this way. Then the Pecker test is a permeability test which is generally performed for rocks. So in this coursework, we are mainly going to focus upon this point number one, which is the determination of, per, per, of hydraulic conductivity by installing wells with observation force. So let's see how can we determine the permeability of soil or the hydraulic conductivity of soil by having pumping wells with observation force. For this, let's consider a soil strata as shown here. We have a sand layer, which is a pervious layer, and a clay layer, which let's say is a totally impervious layer. So let's assume this kind of soil strata. In this soil strata, let's consider that this is our initial groundwater table. Now in this <coughs> sort of soil conditions, let's drill a borehole, and this is a large diameter borehole. In fact, let's dig a well here. Now let's make a well here. If I install a well at this location, like I just remove the soil from this zone, I remove the soil out, what will happen? So once I'll take the soil out, what will happen to the water table in this, uh, in this test well? So yes, after some time, the water level will always try to keep its position and that's why water will always fill to the initial water level. Then let's do this, that this was our test well. Let's do two boreholes. We call them our observation wells. Now these observation wells are the same as the test well and these test wells, the only difference is that these observation wells are smaller in diameter. This test well, let, let me tell you, is something similar of a well that you might have seen in, in villages. So this is nothing different. It is a similar kind of a well that you have seen in your villages. Or you might have seen some, some tube wells installed maybe in your housing society or in any area where some tube wells are installed. So this well is very similar to that uh, to those tube wells. So the only difference between this test well and the observation wells, as I said, is the difference in the diameter. So since this test well is our main well, so we keep the diameter large, and these observation wells are only for the initial testing purposes, and after that we have to discard them. So that's why we want, do not want to put a lot of money in, on it, so we have smaller diameter wells. So once we perform these, um, drill these observation wells, the water table in these observation wells is also going to get the same initial level. So what we can do is we start, if we start pumping water out from this test well, let's start pumping water out from this test well. So we, ins we install some pump here and while using that pump, we start pumping water out. The rate of pumping we can also know by the capacity of the well that we are install, installing here. So what do you think will happen if we start pumping water out from here? Then naturally what, what will happen is that this groundwater table, it will start going down. And this water table will go down somehow. Now if the water table goes down because of pumping, what will happen to the water level in observation well number one and observation well number two, let's say? Yes, the water table, because of the lowering of water table in this test well, water table in both the two observation wells is also going to go down. However, it is interesting to know that the water level in the well, which is closer to the test well, will go down more compared to the well which is far from the test well. And this is again common, this is again common sense from which we can know this thing. So what happens is actually this, we get this kind of a drawdown surface because of pumping water out from the test. So we have the basic, <clears throat> test setup which is done like this. Now another important thing that you need to know in this in case of pumping water test is 
that once we start pumping water out of this well, water will start going down. A stage will come when the rate of, when the water taken out because of pumping is going to be equal to the water coming into this well from the sides. It is obvious that if we take the water out from this well and we stop this pump, if we stop this pump, this water level will start com coming back. Why will this water come back to the natural level? Water will come back to the natural level because there is continuously water coming into this well from all the sides. So if we stop this pump, very soon this water table will come back to its natural position, which is here. But this water table stays at a lower level because we continuously keep pumping water out from this well. So because we continuously keep pumping water out of this well, this water level stays at a lower level. Now a stage comes when the rate of pumping water out becomes equal to the rate of water which is flowing into this well. Stage comes when the when the rate of water flowing out of this well become equal to the rate of water which is flowing into this well. This is the stage at which this water level becomes constant and this is the state which is known as the steady state condition. This steady state condition, the term of steady state condition would not be new for you because this is the same term which we have been using while explaining about the constant head and the falling head permeability test. So this is the basic setup which is used for the pump out test. Now the same things that I've just explained to you are going to be written in descriptive form on the next slide for your understanding as well. So we use the pumping test to determine the hydraulic conductivity of the soil. What we do is we have a test well from where we pump the water out at a constant rate. We install some observation wells at certain distance away from the wells. And once the steady state is reached, we make continuous observations of the water level in the test well and in all the observation wells. The the steady state is set to be reached when the water level in our test well and as well as in our observation wells becomes constant. So this is the generic procedure of the pump out test. Now let's see the more specific procedure of the of this test and how can we determine the hydraulic conductivity by using this test. So this in-situ permeability test by using the pump out test in a test well is going to be ex explained for two different scenarios. One is for an unconfined aquifer case and second for the confined aquifer case. Let's see how can we determine the in-situ permeability in an unconfined aquifer. So this figure explain shows the same figure that we have seen previously. This is for an unconfined aquifer. You see, we have we have a pervious layer here, and there is an impervious layer at the bottom. This figure is pretty similar to the figure that we have seen a couple of slides earlier, where there was a sand layer overlying a clay layer at the bottom. So clay layer was the impermeable layer and having a pervious layer at the top. So we install a test well here, and then we start pumping water out from it at a at a steady rate Q, we have two wells, we call them well one and well two, let's say, the distance of well number one from the center of our test well, let me call it as R1, the radial distance of observation well two from the center of our test well, let me call it as R2. The other important thing for us is this head level of uh, the drawdown in each observation well. So the water level in each observation well, let me call them as H1 and H2. So if you can understand this configuration, then the permeability in the field can be very easily determined by using 
to this simple equation. So if you know this equation, the hydraulic conductivity of an unconfined aquifer can be determined by using this equation, where K is the permeability, Q is the discharge, it is the steady state discharge at which the water is being pumped out from this well. R1 and R2 are the radial distances of these wells, and H1 and H2 are the head, are the head level from the top of the impervious layer. So by using this equation, we can easily determine the permeability of in an unconfined aquifer. So let's see how can we determine the permeability in a confined aquifer. This figure explains the, shows a typical configuration of pump out test in a confined aquifer. Now, what do we have in case of a confined aquifer? So this is an impervious layer. This is an impervious layer. And at the bottom, we again have an impervious layer. So there is an impervious layer at the top. There's an impervious layer at the bottom. And there is a pervious layer at the center. So as we have seen previously, so a confined aquifer is the one in which a pervious layer is entrapped between two impervious layers. So because of the presence of these impervious layers, the flow inside this pervious layer is more like a pressure flow. And because of this pressure flow, the water level in, in the, if we install a piezometer somewhere here, or if we drill a borehole, the water level rises to a higher elevation compared to, a conf uh, compared to an unconfined aquifer. So let's suppose we drilled a well here in this confined aquifer. This dashed line represents the initial water level uh, in this confined aquifer. Then we started pumping. And once we started pumping, this initial water level dropped to this level here. Because of the, because of the drop in water level in the main test well, water level in the observation wells also dropped to a certain height. Now again, similar to the previous case, if Q is the discharge, R1 and R2 are the radial distances of the observation wells from the main test well, and H1 and H2 are the height of water level from the water height in the main well. So we can determine the permeability by using this equation with K, which is the coefficient of permeability, is given as the discharge. This H represents the thickness of the permeable layer. H represents thickness of the permeable layer. R1 and R2 are the radial distances, and H1 and H2 represents height of water in the observation wells compared to the height of water in the test so by knowing these things, simply by putting everything in these equations, we can easily determine the permeability. Now let's solve a couple of examples. And by solving those examples, we can see how to, how to apply the concepts that we have studied so far. So, <clears throat> So the problem statement says, a layer of sand six meter thick underlies a five meter thick layer of clay. So there is a five meter thick layer of clay, a six meter thick layer of sand underlies the clay layer and overlies a bed of shale. So let me draw a figure which represents this configuration. So I've drawn a figure which represents this configuration. So there is a six meter thick sand layer. So you can see there is a sand layer, which is six meters thick from minus five meters to minus 11 meters. So it is a six meters thick sand layer, which underlies a five meter thick clay layer. So it, the sand layer underlies a five meter thick clay layer and overlies a bed of shale. And this sand layer, overlies a bed of shale. A pumping well sunk to the base of the sand 
yielded 10 into 10 raised to the power minus 3 cubic meters per second. So a test well which was sunk to the base of the sand, that it yielded a discharge of 10 into 10 raised to the power minus 3 cubic meters per second. Observation wells placed at 15 meters and 30 meters from the well. So observation wells placed at 15 meters and 30 meters from the well indicated groundwater levels of 2.5 meters and 3 meters above the depressed water layer in the test well. So remember, this is important for you to understand that these water levels 2.5 meters and 3 meters are the water levels above the depressed water layer in the test well. So this is the depressed water layer in the test well. So these heights of 2.5 meters and 3.5 meters are given from the depressed height in the test well. If you go back to the previous slide, you will also notice this thing that these heights heads are given from the depressed height of the test of the test well okay so our task is to determine the permeability of the soil so the data is given to us and with this data that is given to us we are required to determine the permeability so if you can draw this figure half of the problem is solved and it, the problem becomes very clear because now you can easily comprehend this so you can easily understand that this is the case of a confined aquifer because this permeable layer is confined between an impermeable layer at the top and an impermeable layer at the bottom. So the formula that you have to use is for a confined aquifer. This is the expression that is to be used for a confined aquifer. And this expression, what we are going to do is we are simply going to input the values from, from this figure and once we're going to solve this, we can easily get to our answer. So you can see the discharge is given as 10 into 10 to the power minus 3 meter cube per second. H, which is thickness of the permeable layer, is given as 6 meters. This R1 and R2 is given here. H1 and H2 are something that we have already determined. So on simplifying, we can determine the permeability, the coefficient of hydraulic conductivity of soil as 0.368 millimeters per second. So from this, we get an idea that the rate of flow of water through the soil is less than half millimeters per second. This is how slow the water flows through the soil. Let's solve one more example. And this example says that a field pumping test is carried out to determine the average permeability of a uniform soil deposit 30 meters deep. So there is a 30 meters deep uniform soil deposit and a pumping test is carried out in it. So let me draw a figure again, similar to something that we have done in the previous case. So this figure explains our problem statement. So we, this is, this 30 meters deep is our sand layer. Water table in the deposit is located at a depth of two meter below the ground surface. So water table is located at two meters beneath the ground surface. Steady state is reached under a uniform pumping rate of 0.02 meter cube per second. So the discharge once we started pumping out was 0 0.02 meter cube per second. The two observation wells located at distances of 20 meters and 60 meters show elevations of water level at 2 meters and 0.5 meters below the original water table respectively. So the wells are 60 meters and 20 meters and the two observation wells located at distance of 20 meters and 60 meters show elevations of water level at 2 meter and 0.5 meter below the original water table respectively. So remember that this 2 meter and 0.5 meter which is given in the problem statement 
are the water levels below the original or the initial water level as given in the problem statement. So if these are the initial water levels, so what we need to do is we need to determine, in order to determine H1 and H2, we have to determine them from the basic geometry of the problem. So if this complete is 30 meters, so from this 30 meters, this is 48 meters, and from this 28 meters, we can easily determine our H2 to be 26 meters. So this is from this initial water level to the bottom of the sand layer, it is 28 meters, and subtract two from here, we get 46 meters. In the same way, we can get H1 as 47.5 meters. So this is a case of a confined of an unconfined aquifer because we have a sand layer here and this water level here is open to the atmosphere. So for this unconfined aquifer case, we have to use a appropriate formula. And in this formula, we are just going to input all the values we, to get the permeability. So this discharge is given here as 0 0.02 meter cube per second. R1 and R2 can be obtained from here, 60 and 20. H1 and H2, we have already determined it from this figure. And by simplifying, we get an answer of 8.72 into 10 to the power minus 2 millimeters per second. So I hope from these examples, you can get a good idea of how to determine the permeability of soil in the field, both in a confined aquifer and also in an unconfined aquifer. Thank you very much.